Thank you, Jenny. So, yeah, I'm an artist. Um, what do artists do? Well, we've heard from an artist there and um, very eloquently about some of the aims and goals of artists. Um, it's odd as an artist, I think, because you feel a little bit isolated. You feel like, what are your goals in life? And I've come to the conclusion that my goal in life is to show us to ourselves. And in that way, I'm about challenging culture, really, and pervasive culture, culture that we don't necessarily know is around us, making it visible. And it's been really interesting sitting here and, and listening to all of you talking, all the speakers talking, and that's exactly what you're saying. It's about challenging culture, and more than that, creating culture, which um, I think lots of artists don't like to admit they're doing, but I think they're trying to do that. So I want to start by talking about a, a familiar subject that Jos talked about, being at school, being a kid. Um, and this is kind of where it all started for me, and this, this is a kind of... I'm going to take you on a bit of a story of uh, what I've been doing and, and what I kind of hope to be doing in the future and hope that has some meaning for you. Um, so, yeah, when I was at school, I, I used to um, stare out of the window a lot and I used to also um, pretend I was an animal a lot. And these two things were quite important to me. And one day, um, the teacher called my mum in to school and she said, look, he's just staring out the window all the time. He doesn't do any work. And there's a sort of genuine worry about this. And to, to my mum's credit, she said, that's, that's him being creative. And um, she told me that recently, and I didn't know this. And um, I thought that was amazing that she sort of recognised that. And that's, that's sort of something that's taken me almost this long to realise that that's kind of what I've, that's been my battle in life, to understand the fact that my imagination and what I can, um, and the world that I can enter, that, which isn't this conscious reality, is equally as significant as this world. So this is me, up a tree, and I am not pretending to be, but I am a bird, a quite a rare bird called a goshawk. As you can see, I am that bird. Now I am believing that I am that bird. Now this is me challenging the idea that we live in one reality. This is me thinking my imagination in that I can believe in enough to believe that I can be something else. Now I got someone to, to take this picture, but they were quite a long way away, just to show me that it didn't work. Because actually, <laughs> when I was up there, I was really believing that I was. And it's this kind of uh, commitment to my imagination, this sort of um, immersion that's been, been really important. <clears throat> um, also, this idea of becoming an animal, it seems to be quite a, um, quite a, a good vehicle for me. Um, and I started to do this myself, and I, I was the test for this, to see, see, see what this would do, how, how much I could believe in this. And then I started to take it out into the real world. And this was a, a residency I did in the Galapagos Islands. I have a big problem with, with conservation there. The animals are basically more important than the people that live there. So I, 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 went, I did a, a report for the local TV um, news as a blue-footed booby, this quite rare bird, but iconic bird of the island. So I dressed up, I made this home, homemade costume, and I walked around the town, um, sometimes driving on the back of this, uh, this truck, like the Pope Mobile, and, and I sort of could say things, and I, I noticed things because I had this other perspective, because I was able to enter into this other world, which was entirely of my own creation, I could then have perspective um, and see things very clearly, actually. And also, I could say things that probably weren't being able to be said by politicians and other local people that were quite contentious, but ultimately, I think, quite healing. Because in a, in a way, I wasn't a threat. I was just an animal. I was just in my imagination. And a, as a society, we, I think, generally devalue that place. We, we don't give it the significance it needs. And then I went further on, and I thought, well, this, this imaginative world that I have, I need, to, I need to really test this. I need to put this on the line. So I thought, okay, well, if, if I'm going into my sort of dream space, so I'm, you know, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm going somewhere now, and it's very real for me, and I'm coming out and telling you about it, and then I'm in it again. So I, you know, I, I, I became quite good at this, actually going somewhere real and seeing things. And I thought, how can I test this? Maybe people can ask, ask me questions. And I could see if I could answer um, those questions 
and I could find a logic within this. I could bring this back into rationality. I could make this sort of functional and pragmatic. So I've, I've sort of went on the journey around the world, asking people to ask me questions. I went to Stavanger in Norway, and um, I asked a mayor there to ask me a question. He asked me a question about um, uh, prostitution there. I went to Japan, and uh, the, the Tokyo City Council asked me a question about cycle parking. And then I went to Israel, and I saw the mayor of Halon, and I was in his office with him, and he asked me a question that was sort of related to the Palestinian crisis. Now, all these things I don't really know much about, but the idea for me was that if I trusted my imagination enough, if I trusted the idea of unconscious thinking, the idea that I do have knowledge, the idea that I do have um, uh, uh, experiences that are valuable, then I could hopefully relate to anything that comes my way. So within all these things, I felt like I was offering an insight through an unconscious process. I was finding a rationality that wasn't being used before in very intractable circumstances like this. And then more recently, I spent about four years in the Elephant and Castle. I don't, in London, I don't know if you know the area, in South London, it's, um, it's quite a uh, historically deprived area. And there are big plans to knock, knock it all down, uh, all these 60s housing developments. And there's a big vision, really, by the council, by the mayor of London, by the government. All these big agencies brought forward their visions for the Elephant and Castle. And I just thought, that's what I'm dealing in. I'm, 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 I'm dealing in visions. I'm having visions. I'm talking to people about these visions. And these visions are powerful. And they have, they have information in them that we need. Um, so I thought, OK, well, I'm going to have my own vision for this place. Now, the official vision is basically knocking down all these council flats, and about 3,000 people live there in the Haygate estate, and building luxury flats for rich people. So basically, all the people in these flats are, were gonna, or have been now moved out and dispersed across London. And that's dispersed all the communities that exist there, and all the amazing um, interactive, sort of, um, or interconnected, uh, roles that people played for each other, the informal network, really, of people. And the council did their own um, consultancy process to decide what they should do with the, uh, the people there and, 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 and their input in this. But it turns out they, the, the people there didn't really have their own vision. They weren't asked for their own vision. So I felt like I should, I should in a way, find a vision, really. So I went to see the council and got them to have their own visions. This is the planning department in, in Southwark Council who are responsible. So rather than the corporate vision, I said, well, come on, what is your personal vision? So they went into their imagination and, and dreamt up some quite amazing things that would have been amazing, but anyway. Um, and then I teamed up, and I did this with residents and um, uh, off, uh, office workers and developers, all the people involved. And I teamed up with this band called Chrome Hoof. Notice the chrome. And um, you'll start noticing there's quite a lot of costume involved in my work. Um, and they're kind of a death metal, sort of psychedelic, um, punk, um, amazing band. And I thought, okay, how can, I, how, can I, um, how can I communicate this vision? How can I actually have a vision? I've heard all these other people's visions. I think I need to sublimate those and maybe have my own. So we decided to put on a concert in the Coronet Theatre in Elephant Castle which seats about um, 1,300 people. And this was really a culmination of everything that I'd experienced. A very sort of physical consultation, a very, um, very visceral consultation. Um, not really language-based. It, it was just about, in a way, expressing um, what, what, I suppose, expressing a vision in a way that has some kind of um, link and connection to the people it was affecting. Beautiful seals. They're beautiful seals. They're beautiful seals. They're beautiful seals. Yeah. 
So, um, so after this, this odd consultation, I went back to the council and um, I had to remember what I'd seen, really, in my imagination, what had come out with this, um, this improvised performance with Chrome Hoof. None of that was planned. We just had a, a beginning and ending and we were on stage for about an hour. Um, and I went back to the council and I told them, well, I saw these seals and I, I, saw, I saw these geese do this stuff. And it's always animals with me. And I saw these swallows. Anyway, the upshot was, that they really had a responsibility to these people. And there's something called sight tenacity, really, which I recognized in, in, in swallows. They're very loyal to sight. And that's a very uh, physical embodiment of psyche. And it's very important to people. And once you start breaking that up, you start breaking up um, very, very complex communities. And in a way, it's impossible to just invent community, which they're trying to do. So <coughs> um, the... The idea of acting politically was, was in, in this imaginative way, was quite important. But um, then I started to think about what is the imaginative world itself? What does it do for us? Um, how does it really relate to life itself? And I started working in a hospice in North London. I worked there for about two years, off and on. Um, well, every week I went in and I had lunch with patients there. And we just started talking. And the patients started to say, well, what, what are you doing here? You know. I said, well, I'm artist in residence. I've set this thing up, and I'm, I'm just chatting to you. And they said, yeah, but what are, you, what are you actually doing? And I said, well, what can I do for you? And they said, well, what can you do? And then I sort of started to realize, yes, what actually can I do? And I started to break down what my skills are. And as an artist, you're never really asked that. I'm sure you're asked that a lot in business. Um, so I said, well, I, I, you know, I trust my imagination. I, I can live through it. I, I, I think it's significant. It's important. I think there's truth there. I think there's, there's uh, knowledge there. And there's huge untapped resources there. Um, and it turns out that all of them, because they were generally confined in their, in their, in their hospital hospice rooms, they were really living through their imagination. They, they were relying on their imaginations to create a world for themselves. So the conversations became quite, quite interesting in that sense. And there's one guy, Alex. He, he told me, well, I've, I've always wanted to go to the Amazon. I've always wanted to go and see this very, very remote tribe. I always wanted to go and ask them these questions. I said, well, are you doing that? And your imagination says, yeah, I've, I am, but I've only got so far. You know, I, I need to know what's around the next bend of the river. I need to know what they're going to say. I can't invent that stuff. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I'll go and be your imagination. I'll travel to the Amazon. So I got the funds together, and um, I, I, I went, I took, it took about three days to, to get to this tribe. And I spent about three days with them. 
And then I came back. And as soon as I got off the plane, I went back to see Alex at the hospice. And he just grilled me about my trip. And he didn't even call it my trip. He called it our trip. It's like he went on this trip. And um, he just asked for all this information that he needed. And in the end, and he, he died about three months later, he's, he's, we talked again before he died, and he, he said, this is amazing. It, it gave me, when I was really suffering, it gave me the extra bit of, um, the extra bit of um, jungle to explore, the extra other conversation to have, the extra other place to live through, either because the pain was bad or because he was so confined. It was a very real place for him. And that, for me, was um, a real testament to what I've been trying to do, in a way, which is to acknowledge our society's dependence or over-dependence on rational, the rational conscious world. We are over-dependent to our own suffering, really. And we only realize that we live through our imagination so much when we're forced to. So I wrote this book called A Practical Guide to Unconscious Reasoning. It's quite a, uh, a light title, I think. <laughs> trips, trips off the tongue. Should be the almanac, shouldn't it? Anyway. Um, <coughs> So this is really a, a book I wrote uh, last year, um, and it's really trying to sublimate all that experience that I had, and think, okay, this is this is open to everyone. This is practical. This is practical skills. These are skills that sort of everyone should have, really. And it's really a handbook for the imagination. It's just full of um, exercises you can do, but ultimately, it's asking you to put your imagination to the test. It's asking you to risk utterly letting go, and not think, let your um, images you have guide you, and notice what you see, notice what you experience, and bring those back. But do that with a task, preferably a question. And the reason really for writing the book was because I started doing a few workshops, and uh, this woman, um, I was saying, okay, everyone close their eyes, we're gonna go on a, a journey now in our imagination, we're gonna walk down this road. And after about a minute, we stopped. And then uh, I said, oh, did you, did you manage to go anywhere? Did you manage to see anything? He said, well, I've had my eyes closed. I said, yeah, I know, but did you, did you see anything in, in that darkness? Did anything come through? He said, no, because I had my eyes closed. I couldn't see anything. So in, in a way, it really showed me how the, the, the degrees to which we, we live our lives through this. And I think some people do it more than others, and I think that's obvious. But I think we're not really taught. We're not really schooled in this. We don't really utilize this much. And to that end, I thought, okay, right, let's, let's create a school. So I created a school of the imagination. Um, and it only ran for a week, but I did it in the East End. And I asked people, I put out an advert, I said, who wants to be in the school of the imagination? And lots of people uh, came in and I interviewed people. But most of the people came from this organization called Cardboard Citizens, which is people who have been homeless at some point. And they, were, they had this amazing um, ability to be able to let go and invest in their imagination, a, a wonderful skill. Um, so we basically trained up. We trained up by uh, understanding different perspectives, understanding our own personal internal perspectives that we have, um, looking foolish and how important this is, um, humility, um, and also the idea of uh, really convincing yourself that um, the person you're talking to is intelligent in this case. These conversations went on for hours, it's amazing. But mostly, it was the ability to invest and believe in your imagination, believe in an imagined world, and this was very important. And then we took these, this, as a group, we went out on the street, and we set up this flip chart, and we found strangers, and we said, have you got something you can't solve for yourself, rationally? And then we'd write up their question, and this guy here we were working for, how can I approach this job interview differently? And he's really been struggling with it. He said he's been so many job interviews, he's not getting the jobs. So it's a big thing for him. And I love this. It's like putting art, at, you know, something's at stake. It's putting, putting something on the line. So we all got together as a group, and we put these, these white glasses on, which sort of protect us. And um, we went into our, our worlds, our imagined worlds, with this question. And we came back with some stories, basically. Some stories which we didn't really try and make the, the, the links to, but he did. He made the meanings for himself. And that was what was so wonderful, is that he's making the art. He's making the, the, the purpose. He's making the meaning. This is a woman, Irene. She lives on the local estate where we're doing it, at the community centre. 
And her question was, what stops me from starting my own business? She's been wanting to do this for years. And it's so simple. She doesn't want her own business. <laughs> but she's, she's been battling with this for, for years. And she, couldn't, she could not see that. She couldn't see it until we came up with these stories of cows and fields and mountains and pumas and chickens and all these different and strange wheat fields, strange scenarios where we had interactions in, this, in these other worlds. And we had inter interactions that were significant as experience, and we took knowledge from that. And she related to that in that way. So then the ultimate uh, challenge for us as a group during that week, and this is sort of day four, really, so this is quite advanced now, we, we went to see uh, City Hall in London. So we went to the, the, mayor's, the mayor's office, really, and we said, can, can we work for you? Well, I arranged it beforehand, obviously. And this is the health team. Now, basically, the health team organise um, health policy. And we offered our services to them. OK, so we're the um, Unconscious Reasoning Consultancy Group. OK, I'm Helen. I'm Liz. And uh, we work in the health team here for the mayor in London. And our job is to help him to make London a healthier place. It's not to think about hospitals and health services. It's about helping people be as healthy as they can and uh, to make London a place that it's easy to be healthy. So, do you have a question that you haven't been able to sort out rationally? Yeah. Um, our question is, if people know something is uh, bad for their health, why do they carry on doing it? OK, I'll write that up. If people uh, do something that's bad for them... If people know that something's bad for their health... Yeah. Why do they keep on doing it? And it's almost as though the question acknowledges that just information is not enough. Mm, yeah. It's better than nothing. It's yeah. a beginning, but just the information is, doesn't seem to be quite oh, enough. Oh, yeah. That's, I think that's always the case. Just because we know something's Absolutely. bad for our health, mm. doesn't we? Yeah. <laughs> that would never be enough. You know what I mean, we, I think wanted. we all know lots of stuff. Mm, yeah. You can find out anything that you want on the internet, on YouTube. We can, you can know yeah. Anything that you want to know, we know that knowledge doesn't change behaviour. If you'd like to move your chair slightly back. <clears throat> Let's move our chairs back to the wall. Give us some space. OK, if you just find... This became about behaviour change, really. Um, and that was an interesting question for us because it's an irrational question. It's about irrationality. Ultimately, we're not rational beings. We, 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 we kid ourselves that we are, but we, we live in our unconscious. Um, I think someone said, George Lakoff said actually, who's a, a, a psychologist, he said, um, our, our thinking, our reasoning is 98% unconscious. Our conscious, our conscious uh, minds are, are fairly small and limited. I mean, we can only apparently remember seven things. But unconsciously, we can remember an infinite amount of things. So we were pulling on these resources, really, and we came up with some really interesting answers for them that they, they really valued, and what they valued most was witnessing us coming up with these answers. I mean, some of the stuff they knew before, but it, was, it, was, it, it gave it an element of truth for them. It was coming from people. It was coming from a, a place that they could actually see. <coughs> so that's it, really. Um, this is, um, this is the last slide I'm going to show you. It's, uh, it's something from the book. It's on an elementary level. <laughs> but this is, I took this into a school recently, and I put it up on the board, and it was an art class, and we were using the imagination productively. And then the maths teacher came in, and um, he stood at the back for the whole lesson, trying to work this out. <laughs> and then, um, then I said to him, did you work it out? And, and the, Brilliant thing was, 90% of the kids knew the answer. And um, he said, no, no, I know it, I know it. You, you, you move all these ones down one. No, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, no, uh, you add one to all of them. And no, no, hang on, I can't. And then the kids were just laughing at him. And that, that really showed me also that the idea of acquired knowledge, the idea of being an expert, we are all an expert in ourselves. We are all an expert in our imaginative worlds. And we can use these for lateral thinking, for creativity, for everything. So, yeah, I'll tell you the answer if you don't know it later. Thank you.